Hi, my name is Brian Robert Moore, and I'll be reading from my translation of A Silence Shared by Lala Romano, published by Pushkin Press. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to read uh, for Translators Allowed in partnership with the War Prize for Women in Translation. So this novel tells the story of Julia, who's a version of Romano herself, who returns to her hometown of Cuneo during the Second World War. While she's there, she develops a very deep relationship with another couple who's come from Turin like her, Ada and her husband, Paolo, who is a partisan involved in the resistance, who eventually has to take refuge in the surrounding countryside due to a mysterious illness. <clears throat> the part I'll read describes Julia's walk that she takes essentially every day to visit the couple at their hideaway. And hopefully it gives the brief glimpse of why I consider Romano to be one of the most poetic and musical prose writers of the last century. <clears throat> I would eat and then immediately set out since I had a long way to go. But at the corner of the piazza, I would stop to buy roasted chestnuts because I was still hungry and because I liked them and especially liked eating them along my walk. In a nook between two pillars, an old woman bundled up in rags, but nevertheless solemn, sibyl-like, had set up her roaster. Ever since I was little, I had always seen that old woman, or one just like her, surrounded in the autumn and the winter by a crowd of soldiers, the Alpini in their short grayish green capes. Their boots would screech on the stone and the aroma of the chestnuts would mix with the pungent smell of wet cloth and leather. Now the barracks along the main street leading out of town from the piazza were dismantled, empty, converted in part to prisons. Here and there, from the windows with no panes, a young man looked out in his regular country clothing. Someone, to add a touch more sadness, would be singing, I'd stop shelling chestnuts as I passed before them, hurrying my pace. Crossing the towering bridge was thrilling, below emptiness. And while walking forward, the mountains rising up, moving towards you. There was a checkpoint at the end of the bridge, a camouflage tent in front of which an armed soldier paced up and down. I passed by unhurriedly, chewing my chestnuts. The main road led uphill towards the valleys. I turn onto an older side road, the kind that reach out of the way farmsteads and run by the hamlets that scattered along the flat stretches of land between the town and the mountains. The few chestnuts still left to take from the paper cone were nearly all spoiled, moldy, bitter tasting. They too, products of wartime. I sank my teeth into them cautiously, spitting out the bitter parts and chewing slowly the good ones. Having emptied the cone, I would try to clean my fingers with the water from a stream, which cleaned nothing, and wipe them with a handful of dry poplar leaves, which left a nice smell on my hands, a hint of spring that was hardly there at all. From the country road, I would turn onto another grassier road, really more of a path, at certain points, it squeezed between heaps of stones covered in brambles before becoming muddy or crowded with big rocks. There were lines of mulberry trees in the surrounding fields or scattered walnut and apple trees. It was the kind of tight-fisted beauty born of poverty. On the highest branches of the apple trees, I would eye a few forgotten fruits, gleaming red, Sometimes a far, fallen apple shimmered on top of the dirt in the field amid the sparse strands of newly sprouted wheat. Then I would look around me like a thief, climb over the low hedge and run into the field. If a growling dog caught sight of me, my heart would leap into my throat. I'd hide the apple, always a tiny thing, in my hand. I knew that when the road is long, Somewhere after the midpoint, there comes a moment of weariness, of discouragement, and that it usually coincides with the most solitary, the most abandoned point in the road. For me, it would occur when I reached a low, dilapidated house, black with soot. It looked like no one lived in it, 
yet an old and raucous dog would still jump up out of nowhere, half choking on its chain. That rabid fury rubbed me the wrong way, repelled me, and I would feel tempted to turn back. It no longer seemed true that there was anyone waiting for me out there. I felt as though I could sense the presence of what had become universal misery, now that it had reached and tainted even those innocent places out on the edges of the world. There would come over me a feeling of bewildered loss, which was reflected back to me in everything, and which for that very reason also had, deep down, something sweet to it. After passing that dilapidated place, I'd walk by another farmhouse that opened out onto the road, and which seemed, as in a fairy tale, the good house opposite the, opposite the wicked house, because it was poor but happy looking. Its yard was cluttered with bundles of wood, straw mattresses laid out to dry, long fabrics for swaddling infants, silent but full of life. Just beyond, there was a wayside shrine. After that, I would make my way directly through the fields as a shortcut. Thank you very much.